ABNC, America's Black News Channel. Watch us on all major cable providers and major streaming platforms. Finally, news that speaks to us. 50 years ago this week, the National Black Political Convention made history. Convening in Gary, Indiana, the gathering brought together some of the greatest thought leaders of the time. We're talking about men and women who were just over two-party politics. They were frustrated with the system and the state of black America. Participants spoke to the concept of unity without uniformity, and the three-day gathering represented all facets of black America. And it was just a year before that Marvin Gaye sang his iconic hit, What's Going On, as the 10,000 attendees sought answers to that very question. Well, joining me now to give me some context to the historic meeting and draw parallels for our time is historian and professor of political science at San Francisco State University, Professor Robert Smith. Professor, thank you so much for joining us here on Amplified. You're welcome. All right, set the scene for us, Professor. Why was this meeting called? What, what was it hoped for that they would accomplish? Well, Dr. Martin Luther King had been murdered. Uh, his charismatic leadership had kind of dominated black politics. After his death, black people, black leaders began to say, we don't need charismatic leaders anymore. We need collective leadership. This was particularly the case among black, the newly elected black officials, black elected officials, and then particularly the Congressional Black Caucus. So they said, instead of this one dominant charismatic leader, we need to have a collective leadership that brings together a body of men and women that represents black America. One person can't do it. We need a collective leadership. That was the kind of major impulse for it at that time. And that makes so much sense. But why Gary, Indiana? Well, one of the uh, principal organizers of the convention was Gary, Indiana Mayor Richard Hatchett, uh, one of the first of blacks elected to mayoral ships in major American cities. And he was one of the co-leaders of the convention. And as mayor of Gary, he invited the convention to convene in his city. He thought it was appropriate as an expression of black power for the National Black Political Convention to meet in a city where you were seeing the emergence of black power at the urban level. So that was one of the reasons uh, that, uh, probably the main reason that Gary was selected. Yeah, that makes sense. So tell us then about the meeting structure. It was like a caucus of sorts, wasn't it? No more than a caucus. It was designed to be like a Democratic or Republican convention in which each state would send representatives in proportion to its population. They would be democratically selected and they would come together and claim that they were, through that process of selection, they were a body that represented the broadest range of opinions in the black community, particularly ideological opinions in the black community. So it was the Congressional Black Caucus, a relatively narrow body at that time, 13 persons. That's a caucus. And they said a caucus can't do this job of collective leadership. We need a convention that represents the broadest spectrum of black people in the United States. Broad spectrum. OK, awesome. So. Help us understand the Gary Declaration and the call to move toward independent black politics. Well, the Gary, both of those are very controversial. The Gary Declaration was a mixed bag. It included both mainstream liberal democratic programs or policy proposals like full employment and welfare reform. And then it included radical black nationalist ideas like the idea of a separate black nation, which is advocated by the Republic of New Africa. And then it included radical left ideas like the confiscation of American corporations in the, in the redistribution of those resources to African Americans. So it was, a, it, was an elect, it was an eclectic agenda. It was not one ideology. Multiple ideologies were, were represented in the national black political agenda which of course was one of his strengths, and then of course, ultimately his greatest weakness. And what about Reverend Jesse Jackson calling for a third political party, a third black political party? Tell us about that. And do you think that might play out today? 
a third political party today? No, I don't think a third political yeah, party how, how, would today. Well, Reverend, Reverend Jackson really? was Why not? probably be well because the structure of the of of the American party system, the winner take all in the electoral college, for example, means that the third party is always going to lose, and in fact, it's likely to benefit the party that is most supposed to. So, if you ran a black third party, the beneficiary of that, of course, would be the Republican Party. That is because we don't have proportional representation. One man, one vote. We have the electoral college where the votes are distributed on a statewide basis. So that that has made it from the beginning of the nation very, very difficult to have long-term viable third parties. But at the convention, Jesse Jackson was the most passionate advocate of establishing a black political party. Uh, that was primarily the sentiment of a majority of the convention delegates, but the leaders including Amir Baraka, but also Congressman Diggs and Mayor Hatcher persuaded Jackson to withdraw that proposal and persuaded the convention not to pursue the idea of a black political party, primarily mainly for the reasons that I suggested earlier, that if there had been a black political party in 1972, it would have only redounded to the benefit of the Republicans. Of course, Nixon won by a huge landslides we wouldn't have made that much difference but the established black leadership in congress the mayors the elected officials thought the idea of a black political party was uh unwise in terms of their place inside the democratic party mm, okay so what about other notable participants we talked about jesse jackson who else uh, participated well i guess the principal participant, leader of the convention, the person probably more central in getting it started and organized and successful was Amir Baraka from Newark, New Jersey. He was the formerly Leroy Jones, the poet. Uh, at that time, uh, Baraka was a cultural nationalist. And, see, he, and so he favored a kind of cultural separation from mainstream America. Uh, and then, of course, Mayor Hatcher, uh, Congressman Conyers, Congressman Dellums, uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, Betty Shabazz, the, the wife of Malcolm, they also attended, but they did not play a major role. Perhaps the leading black right, woman right. political figure at the time, Shirley Chisholm, did not attend because she at that time was running for the presidency herself, and she was being opposed by the leaders of the convention. Mm. So I got to ask you, finally, would you say this is a blueprint for what would become Black Lives Matter? And can you compare the two? No, I don't think it's a blueprint for Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is really, we talk about that, it's really an extraordinary uh, group or uh, organization in black politics. It's a black, queer-led, largely feminist formation that is a protest protest movement, protest organization, whereas the Black Political Convention was largely trying to straddle the divide between protest and politics, ultimately ending up being a little bit of both. So no, I would I would see I would say probably the major consequence of the convention of 72 was that it inspired a lot of blacks to run for go back home and run for office and get elected in many cases. And it, was, it provided a kind of blueprint for the Jesse Jackson presidential campaigns of 1984 and 1988. Well, you are just a plethora of knowledge. It's been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Professor Robert Smith, historian and professor of political science at San Francisco State University. Appreciate your time here on Amplified.